Hello, everybody. Um, I am Victor Payan, the Director of Media Arts Santa Ana, and I want to welcome you to our uh, wonderful conversation today. We're very excited to have two acclaimed authors joining us to talk about their new Amazon best-selling book, Ignite the Fire Within, Master Your Speaking and Writing. Uh, and these two folks are Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, who is a Harvard medical professor, uh, and he is the author of several books. He's an acclaimed speaker, but he's the author of several books, um, including Brother Deepak, uh, who, uh, here we go, the titles are Live Better, Live Longer, Leadership by Example, The Two Most Important Days, and then Brotherhood, which is the story of growing up with his, uh, his brother, also a writer, and speaker Deepak Chopra. And we also have uh, Rick Nahara, who uh, is an acclaimed uh, comedian, writer, screenwriter, actor, producer, who uh, was a co-founder of Latins Anonymous. He uh, authored the uh, one of the few plays on Broadway, Latino plays on Broadway, uh, Latino Logs. And he um, was a, a writer for Mad TV, um, East Los High, I'm missing a big one over there too. Uh, the Culture Class Show, um, uh, in, and, in Living in, Color. That's right, in Living Color. Uh, how could I miss that one? And then also uh, author or uh, writer of a, a, a fine holiday film called Nothing Like the Holidays, starring Deborah Missing, Alfred Molina, John Leguizamo, and Luis Guzman. Really great cast. Came out a few years ago. I think it's streaming right now. But a great holiday film. Um, and uh, you wrote it. So they're experts in their field and we're really excited to have them. So um, let's start this conversation. Um, tell us uh, about the book and uh, what started you guys on this path of decide, because you're coming from two different angles. Uh, Sanjeev is coming from the healing arts and Rick, you're coming from comedy, which is itself a healing art. Um, unless you're on stage, then it's quite the opposite sometimes. But um, <laughs> tell us how you got the book started. So, you know, Rick and I met in Porta Vallarta, Mexico. We were having an amazing time. We were invited to speak. I was giving a keynote on leadership and he gave a brilliant talk and it was for 200 inspired Latina women. And it was an amazing time. And we hit it off, first time we met. Uh, we do have a mutual friend or two. And then we would talk every week or two weeks. And he said, I want to work with you. I said, okay, I would like that very much too. Let's write a book. It was a COVID lockdown. So it was a, a good opportunity to avail of a lot of free time. And we connected by Zoom or Starleaf and we worked literally every day for three, three and a half, four hours. We would take a break in between and we wrote the book and we said, listen, between us, we have eight or more decades of speaking and writing nationally, internationally. And a lot of people are, get stage fright. They're concerned about speaking and they're concerned about writing. So let's share some wisdom that we have culled over the decades with the reader. That's, uh, that's very you know, very, very much what happened. Sanji is very factual. I tend to be the, the one that goes into the weird tangents. My weird tangents, we're sharing a cab in, in, in Puerto Vallarta. And I go, I'm going to the restaurant because I'm so the lovely wife of me done. Well, going to the same place. And that's, I would say, is um, serendipity or serendip. It's in the book. So the serendipity moment was we're both sharing a cab. We're both speaking at an event. I see him speaking. He's a wonderful speaker. He's one of the best I've ever seen. And uh, our styles were, were unique. Both, both have very unique styles. Um, Sanjeev is almost, there's a logic to his words. There's, there's a, 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 all these things. I tend to work on the emotional aspects. I'll talk about how I feel or, or those things. And, and together, we're, we found ourselves to be a really good team. That, you know, at moments when we're writing the book, he would say, you know, one point, he's like, Rick, what are we missing? And I said, I, I don't know. Where's the women? So we go, oh, you're right. And we started realizing, you know, our own um, issues of going, hey, we need to include women's speeches. And we hadn't. And so we started adding that. And actually, we had a lot of women edit the book for us. So for us, it was 
a great thing to have a woman's point of view put uh, added to our book. Uh, and the book has so many different points of view because Sanji comes from science. He comes from, um, you know, uh, East Indian culture and background and, and England and Britain and you name it. And I have the Latino Mexican. So at times we bother from uh, borrow from each culture. The one point I, I brought up a, the concept of in Lakesh, the Mayan idea that you are my other self. And he was uh, speaking from Hindu scripture and talking about that and what the, the lessons he could learn. And so it was really almost like a, a, a very, f a book about a world understanding and world culture that we met on this. And the biggest cultural thing we see is communication. And that's what we know, we know is what heals our world. Is people able to communicate with each other, to tell their story, to honor their story, to honor other stories. All that's in the book. So I think, you know, Deepak Chopra himself uh, did a forward and, and said how the book is also about life. And so it is a, it is a very multi-layered book, and, but it's been a pleasure to work with Sanjay. And I think that's an interesting point because the need to communicate is, is universal. It's a human expression going back to the, as soon as we learned how to communicate. Um, and in different cultures, I mean, writing is very revered, but ironically, the act of being a writer is not really revered. It's like, oh, you're going to do that and get a real job somewhere else or, you know, find a way to fund your passion. And so there's a lot of discouragement for people to, to start as writers or to tell their story, which is really, really important right now, especially as you guys mentioned that this uh, project was started at the beginning of the pandemic, a moment when everybody on the globe had to become a writer to communicate, had to sit at a keyboard and put their thoughts down in order to, to remain connected with the rest of the world. So you guys start in your book with uh, the first um, chapter is called Say Yes to You. So talk a little bit about that, how important it is, because like I said, there's a lot of, especially, you know, artists and writers tend to have a lot of, a lot of doubt and um, insecurities and that the creative process is a way of overcoming that. So tell me why it's so important to say yes to you. Well, I'll start off. Um, the reason it's important because I, I remember just a story. My grandfather I asked my grandfather, why'd you come to the United States? Uh, he, they, my great grandfather came in like 1910. My grandfather, of course, was with him. And uh, he said, oh, just to work. <laughs> he said that, something as simple as that. And I found out later, I'm researching my family. No, you left because Pancho Villa was coming over to take over your guys' cattle ranch. And you had 10 brothers and sisters, and you weren't about to let, give them the revolution. My great-grandfather saw Pancho Villa more as a, a bandit and saw the revolution as just bringing death and destruction. So they actually packed up and moved to New Mexico, crossing a border that at that time wasn't a border, it was a territory. So all this story and, and you know, family history is, it was, was melted down to, we came to work. And that's not true. That was just part of the story. And I realized just in my culture, the Latino culture, that a lot of times we, we don't think our stories are important. We're, we're, we're being taught eight hours a day that we're not important because we're not seen. Most people consume about eight hours of media. So they're consuming that much media and you're not seeing our images or hearing our stories then you're not important. And that lack of importance is what's, what's, what the book is to inspire people to tell that story. Tell your story, uh, honor your story. You know, um, Sanjeev told, told me a wonderful story about you can go to, uh, I think the Ganges is the place where they, they, they you know, people are, are um, what is it, when they, they, when they basically ignite you there's a term. Cremated. Um, cremated. Yes. Yes. And cremated. So the tell, yes. Yeah. Tell the story, Sanjay, because it's a beautiful story. You went there and how long this history is. Yeah. So there's a lineage of uh, pundits, uh, holy people who track your ancestry. And every time you've gone to this place to immerse the ashes of a parent or a grandparent, they come and they talk to you and then they have a ledger and they keep writing you know, how many children you have, how many grandchildren, your cousins, your nephews, their ages, their names. So our mother passed away 
and uh, Deepak and I flew to India with our wives and we did the cremation in Delhi and then we drove to Rishikesh, holy place, and uh, immersed the ashes. And the Pandit comes out and he says, so what's this person's name? And we said, uh, Pushpa Chopra. He said, no, no, the maiden name. So he said, Pushpa Anand. And they're looking, how many years old? Where did they live in Delhi? Da, da, da. And he says, we can't find her. And so we remembered that when our mother was born, she had a four-year-old older brother. And my grandparents had named my mother Suchinta. And this four-year-old goes to his parents and he says, what kind of a name have you given to my beautiful baby sister? They said, what's wrong with Suchinta? He said, it incorporates chinta, which is negative connotation. It means worry. So they said, you want to give her a different name? He said, yes, Pushpa, beautiful like a flower. So her name changed. Now he was four. He could recite long passages from the scriptures. Didn't know how to read or write. He'd be sitting, having lunch in the back courtyard. I remember that house vividly in New Delhi. And he'd suddenly get up and run to the front gate. And sure enough, a monk was coming by with a begging bowl. He'd invite him and he'd say, I'm not hungry, eat my lunch. His father, my grandfather, shot a pigeon with a BB gun and he admonished him at age four, said, why did you shoot that innocent bird? Something bad will befall you. And then one day he pesters his oldest sister. She was 16, more like a mother to him and says, I want so many rupees. And she said, that's a lot of money. What do you want it for? He says, I owe Dalit, the servant, from a previous life. And he pestered her. Finally, she gave him the money. He goes to the servant. He says, Dalit, I owe you this money from a previous life. And the servant was flustered. He wouldn't take it. So he brings his sister, convince him to take it. So he finally takes it. And then a week later, he says to his sister, she would sing him a lullaby and put him to bed. Tonight, I don't want to sleep on the bed. I want to sleep on the floor. Sleeping on the floor amongst Hindus means you're going to die. Dust to dust, earth to earth. So she's rattled. She says nonsense, puts him in his bed, sings him a lullaby. They wake up in the morning. He's on the floor and he's dead. He changed my mother's name. He admonished his father for shooting a pigeon, he could predict when the monks are coming. He paid an old debt from a previous life and he predicted his own death. So we remembered the story and it's in the logs now, in the books. And we called our aunt in Delhi and said, what was mommy's name before she was Pushpa? Said, Suchinta. So we said, Suchinta Anand. And the priest found the ledger, go back six generations. It's an amazing story. And yeah. you know, storytelling is the most powerful thing we can do. Steve Jobs once said, the most powerful people in the world are storytellers. And we can all get better at telling stories. So one of the sections we have in the book, based on a talk I gave at Harvard Medical School, University of Massachusetts to medical students, how to give a good TED talk. What are the principles of good public speaking? How to use your hands, how to smile, how to change the tone of your voice, how to use what I call the pregnant pause. If I say adversity is a terrible thing to waste, you're listening and you sort of absorb it. But if instead I say adversity is a terrible thing to waste, that one second pause, people actually often lean forward to hear what the guy is going to say. It's much more powerful. So many practical things that we have learned over the years that we've been taught from our amazing teachers and mentors, we've incorporated in the book. That's, that's the great thing about working with Sanjeev and what I found is that he has a, a, a love of history and a love of storytelling. And that's the thing about this book is actually, it's a very uniting book of all cultures because that's one thing mo all, all cultures share stories. I mean, it goes back to our childhood. 
you know, you, you hear a fairy tale and they lived happily ever after. That's humans longing for completion. We long for completion. And that's what stories are. Stories are completion. When in real life, we have no completion. It, we, it's really evolution is what we're dealing with. We're always evolving and changing. But those are the things that humans desire, that idea of completion of a story completed and done. So we find even in the book, you know, what Sanji brought what, so many times was science. Uh, you know, we talk about neuroscience with, with um, um, mirror neurons. Oh, yeah. Mirror, mirror, mirror neurons. And, you know, we talked about that. And that's about compassion. It's about seeing yourself in the other person. And people that actually see plays are more likely to give to charity than other people. That's a fact. So them seeing plays, seeing stories, seeing themselves and other people broaden themselves as human. And that's why, you know, the Mayan in Lakesh, you are my other self, or, or even in the Christian tradition of, of love your neighbor as yourself, seeing yourself in others. And so that, so that in yes. Lakesh actually goes back to uh, the neuroscience uh, of the mirror neurons, see your other yeah. self. So, hey, I have a question, too, now that you bring this up, it's very important, because we as creative people, we kind of inherently know that there's a healing process and a growth process and working through process in the creative act, in creativity. But can you talk about the, the science behind what happens to a person that, that doesn't say yes to themselves, that represses their stories and doesn't feel that they have, you know, the right to express or have an outlet for, for their experience? So, you know, saying yes is an act of faith. It's an act of courage. And if we don't say success, we'll be stuck. We'll be where we are. We're, we're not going to change our lives for the better. We're not going to improve other people's lives. So, so Winston Churchill once said, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality that guarantees all others. So we both had the experience of saying yes, when we weren't confident that we would actually be able to deliver. I remember as a very, very junior faculty member at Harvard Medical School, I gave a talk on viral hepatitis and I called it serendipity, unprecedented opportunity and challenges. And the person who used to give that talk at a very number one Harvard Medical School CME course was moving to a different institution. And he said, can I reach out to the chair of medicine and say, you should give this talk? And I said, yes. And then I prepared and I prepared and rehearsed and made it better. And, and then uh, the next thing I know, the next following year, they invited me to give six talks at that same medicine course. But it took a little bit of faith and courage to be able to say yes. There's also a way to say no. You know, uh, Miguel Ruiz has written a wonderful book called The Four Agreements, The Four Agreements We Make With Ourselves. And one of them is always be impeccable with your word. So if you say yes to something, you must deliver unless you're in the intensive care unit or you've had a stroke or you've passed away. You, there are no excuses. Harry Truman once said, never ruin an apology with an excuse. So is there a way to say no? If, if you're not sure you can do it, uh, make the deadline, then yes. Or if it is not aligned to your purpose in life, no matter how much fame or fortune, so the most amazing physician in our country at the moment is, is Eugene Braunwald, the most eminent cardiologist in the world. He was the chairman of medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Beth Israel Hospital for decades. I've referred to him as God in medicine. And my father was an amazing, brilliant cardiologist in India. And he would hold an international conference in cardiology. And he calls me, this is like 35 years ago. And he says, next year, I want you to invite Eugene Braunwald to give a keynote and run a panel discussion. 
So I discovered that it would cost, we're talking about 40 years ago, it would cost something like $50,000 for his honorarium, his first class airfare, hotel, then he's going to invite two other speakers and panel discussion, world renowned people. So I'm sort of relieved. I called my dad. I said, dad, it's not going to work. It's prohibitively expensive. And he goes, go ahead and invite him. One of his patients would underwrite the whole thing. So I sent him a letter and, and introduced my father, mentioned the conference, mentioned who were the famous speakers in the previous years from Germany, from England, from Australia. And I, I'd be happy to meet with you and go over logistics. Five days later, a letter comes back. Dear Sanjay, what an honor and what a wonderful uh, opportunity it would be. I've looked up your father. He did research on da, 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 da and published in this, this, this journal. What an honor it would be. Unfortunately, I'm on sabbatical and I'm working on the first edition of The Heart, which became the definitive textbook in cardiology. And I'm not accepting any speaking engagements. And then the last sentence blew me away. I hope you will understand and forgive me. This is Gordon <laughs> to a junior faculty. I've used this so many times now. And, and people say, of course, of course, of course, we totally understand. <laughs> but there's a way to say no. And we put that in the book as well as an addendum to the chapter on say yes. What a graceful, what a graceful response. Um, but the important, the most important agreement is that yes to yourself, because that's a lifelong commitment. That's a lifelong journey. Well, well the reason we bring up yes, one of the reasons I, you know, I come from the arts background. So I, I, I did improv with Whoopi Goldberg and Second City, and I did a lot of different. And one of the biggest tenets of, of improv is say yes. Yes, so and. If you, if, yes, and. So if you're in a, uh, you see a situation, you go, that's the biggest pirate ship I've ever seen. And someone says, no, it's not. Well, you've killed the scene. But if you go, yes, it's the biggest pirate ship I've ever seen. And, and that looks like Captain so-and-so. And, and oh, you know, and you, it continues because you're, you're continuing. The, and that captain is sworn to kill you, Captain. We have to fight back. Oh, yes, we do. But we have no ammunition. So, we, but, but I have this. And it's always about, telling the story and keeping it going, keeping the ball in the air. And that's what yes does. And a lot of stuff we talk about in the book is we use examples, even in our own life and lives of others uh, to show where, where yes, for me to get my show on Broadway, I had to uh, do a show at, at a place called town hall, it's about a 1400 seat theater. And I said, yes, we're going to do it. I, Put a check for $35,000, my own money. Didn't tell my wife or anyone I was doing that. Risk it all at all. And uh, a week before the show opened, I, I called the ticket office. And I said, how many tickets have we sold? And the man said, 50. I said, fantastic. That's good. So we're doing 50 today. And we do another. He goes, no, 50 for the entire run. <laughs> 50 tickets for a, a theater that I have $35,000 on. But I've told no one. And I said, we're doing it. Yes. So I brought Eugenio DeBez to a, a radio show that was in Spanish. I said, Eugenio, get on the show. He's outside the door. And I called the, the radio and I go, you have to have Eugenio come on. And they said, oh, well, we'll we need about a week's advance with we'll all these different things. And I said, he's outside your door. Open it. They open the door and there's Eugenio DeBez. Eugenio comes on the show, talks the show up. Uh, we got on a few more, said yes, and it was sold out. That's how I got to Broadway. So I, even in my own life, I've realized I've had to say yes to things. There is no guarantee for the outcome. You know, it's faith. That's what yes is. And, and why not say yes to yourself? I mean, think your individual self. The miracle it took to get you on earth, just to be here in itself, and then to, to give you, a, be born into a culture, be born into a time. All these things are great stories. You know, and that's what uh, uh, storytelling does. When and when you read Anne Frank, Anne Frank lives again. When you read Mark Twain, that era lives again. All these things happen through the power of story. It's a profound power, and that's why saying yes to yourself to telling those stories, especially you know to to my people, Latinos, of saying your story isn't told enough. It needs to be told more. And one of the so, great things about oh, go ahead. You know, uh, all you have to do is give people 
permission and plan to seed. So I'm privileged to serve as a visiting professor in medicine at many, many academic institutions around the country and also abroad. I was at the University of Washington in Seattle before COVID hit. And I spent four and a half days teaching, lecturing, rounds, physical diagnosis, students, nurses. My specialty is liver, hepatology. So I met eight hepatologists and I asked each one of them the question, have you written a book? Most of the time, the answer is no. Have you given a TEDx talk? No. Are you passionate about something? Yes. Everyone says yes to that. I say, you have a book in you. You have a TEDx talk in you. And I have a literary agent in New York. And if you send me the manuscript, I like it. I'll forward it to her. And she'll get you a publisher. If not, you can self-publish or look in Seattle. You know, Victor, 10 months later, I get an email from two of the hepatologists. Sanjeev, you may not remember, you mentioned we have a book in us. We've written a book. One of them is originally from Cyprus. He went on a scholarship to Oxford, brilliant. And the book he wrote was 20 chapters on 20 lessons, stories from his patients. It was riveting. I couldn't put it down. So we can all write, we can all speak, we have a story to tell. And it doesn't have to be a full-time career. That's the other thing. If people say, oh, when they're 16 or 18, I want to be a writer. Will I survive? Will I be able to pay the bills? You can have another job and this can be a parallel career. I mean, look at some of the amazing physicians who have written amazing books. You know, Abraham Verghese. Cutting for Stone. It was on the New York Times bestseller for more than two years. I know him. He's brilliant. He's a professor. He's one of the deans at Stanford now. Siddhartha Mukherjee trained in Boston with us at Harvard Medical School. And he was going to write a blog on cancer and get getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then he decided to make it a book. And it's called The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer. 500 some pages long. His first book, Pulitzer Prize, wins the Pulitzer Prize. So uh, don't hold yourself back. You have a story to tell, tell it. You can get uh, your colleagues and friends to <clears throat> help you, to critique it. Um, there's, there's no end to this. There's, there's no write your first book, then the others become even easier. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no excuse. I mean, that's that's the really the thing is that when you're a professional writer, they give you an assignment and you write. And there's there's no excuse. You can't say, oh, I just don't feel it today or I just don't know. They have a deadline. And they tell you to do it. And being a professional writer, it's the, the, you look at an empty page and you have to fill it. And the, the reason I can say yes easier than someone else, I've filled it many times. And I know I, know I have the capacity, but the capacity really comes from outside me. And there's a certain spiritual aspect to writing that you're listening for a voice. You're listening for a story and that story will come to you. You'll find those stories. Life gives you stories. And that's the one of the things when I look at um, Sanji to work with him, I, I'm fascinated. Every time he talks, I'm like, how did I end up working with such a brilliant man? <laughs> well, because at times, look, when I've gone to Sanji and met him at Harvard, I'm at a party. Virtually everyone there has a PhD and everyone Everyone has a PhD and everyone's done something like, oh, he cured cancer. That one did this one. This. It's amazing people. But they all are fascinated by stories. They all want to tell stories. There was a, a I think that it's like you want your kids to be smart. Tell them, tell them stories. You know, I think that was Einstein said that. Um, and, and you'll find this in the book is it really is inspiration to get people to look at there is no excuse. There is no excuse. You should be writing. You should expand your world, expand your universe constantly. And, and in this act of what, what me and Sanjeev did is saying yes, is we both think that way. You know, yes, we're going to write a book. <laughs> I mean, if we thought about it, we had no plan whatsoever. We just said, let's write a book. And so we just would meet every day and we'd write a book. And all of a sudden, and this is a thing that blows most people away. I have crippling dyslexia. 
you will tell you about it. You can look what I spell and think, oh my God, I can't even understand this man. But I won't allow that to be an excuse to stop me from, from, from tell, writing a book. Dyslexia, I will not let that be an excuse. Nothing will be an excuse because in the end, it's a story. You'll find a way. And I was the one who's doing most of the typing. And I have to say, I, you know, kudos for Sanji for being so patient. But <laughs> he would look... And I would, I would sometimes say, no, I'm, look, I'm a writer. I'm not a speller. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll find it. We'll get a spell checker. And, and also we, you, you bring up some interesting things is that, um, you know, the brain works in, in really fascinating ways. And a lot of times, if there is a condition like dyslexia, for example, I'm a little dyslexic, I'm terrible at math, horrible career for me, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty good writer. But when you're dyslexic, you're also a better performer because you have to think on your feet. You have to constantly yes. respond to these different, you know, cross stimulus. And as a comedian, it's actually an advantage because you can see things from different perspectives. And often maybe something that you misheard or misunderstood becomes something funnier or a different, a different idea. Um, and yeah, that happened uh, many times. Many, yeah. many times it happens. We're, we're, you know, Latin's anonymous. That, you know, that was a great group and we did a lot of comedy and back in the day. But you think about it, I saw a commercial with the you know pocketbell can indeed you know very serious about getting help and i thought wow being a latino sometimes it seems like the same condition we need to be in a meeting we need to say i admit i'm a latino and deal with it all that and that's how that came about it's just a weird way of thinking to see life but that's the artist way it's okay. it's people that look at things differently and and most both me and sanjeev have that um he happens to be probably one of the greatest uh, hepatologist, I think, in the, in the in the world, is that the right term, Sanjeev? Yeah, hepatologist. Yeah, hepatologist. He, he, I mean, Never. the man is 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 brilliant. I mean, he's a brilliant man. But but what's great about him, he his curiosity for life and learning is 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 so amazing that he feels he as as brilliant as a man he had, um, there's more to learn. You know. And, uh, Rick, thank you so much for saying such nice things. Um, I truly appreciate it. But like you and like many people, I think when you are growing, when you are creative, you're happy. So I get invited. I give you know 75 to 100 talks a year. And I'm invited to give a keynote. And I can give one of the 10 keynotes I've given in the last year. And I create work for myself. I say, you know what? I'll prepare a new talk. I'm not mm -hmm. doing this in Chicago in October. I'm giving a keynote and I'm calling it a, a look at the rear view mirror and a peek ahead. And I'm going to talk about some of the bigger stories in medicine in the last 25 years. And then I'm predicting what's going to happen in the next 10 years, things that are playing out now. But it's work for me. And, but I... I love doing it because the creative juices flow, you grow. You know, Mahatma Gandhi once said, live as though you're going to die tomorrow. Learn as if you're going to live forever. What an amazing saying. Right? Live every day to the fullest, but learn. Don't worry how long it's going to take you. Learn as if you're going to live forever. So I think that's when we are growing, we are happy. That's beautiful. And, and in, in a writer's journey, or even a speaker's journey, that first step is so important because nobody starts out, or most people don't start out, already fully formed. It's a, it's a process, it's work, it's, it's, it's learning from experience, it's making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And if you don't start, you're not going to get better. Um, and you have a chapter in your book called Failure and Adversity, and there are a lot of studies right now uh, about the importance of failure in learning, in improving. And the scientific method is like 99% failure. You know, nobody, when they set out to discover something, they don't get it the first time. They have to do it a hundred times, 500 times, prove it. And then they have to do it 500 more times to prove that it's consistent. So, so true. So true. You know, Edison was asked, how did it feel to fail 9,999 times before you came up with the bulb. And he said, I didn't fail 9,999 times. I figured out 9,999 ways in which it doesn't work. 
And when he was 57, his factory burned down and his friends were commiserating with him. And he says, why are you sympathizing with me? All my mistakes are burned down and now I can start anew. See, attitude, I think, is even more important than aptitude. It will get us to the highest altitude. And don't forget, gratitude is also important in there, too. <laughs> yes, gratitude. Uh, gratitude. <laughs> um, tell us more uh, uh, about, about Failure University. Uh, uh, Rick, do you have anything to say? Because this is an important chapter in the book. Um, I, I would say failing in adversity, uh, I, I've really majored in my life. Um, so <laughs> I, think, I, I think what it is, is, is I, I tend to learn early on in life. So I, I was flunked in kindergarten. I've been talking about starting a career, but now I have an MFA and a BA, you know, and I've done all these other things. But if I would have stopped at being flunked in kindergarten, I would have never continued in school. And I, I look at it and I, I, I don't see failure as failure. I see it as opportunity to look at a different way of, of, of a, a problem. You know, the, just like, um, you know, Alexander Graham Bell is that people that are constantly searching and trying to improve and trying to do a thousand things, failure is part of the journey. And once you understand failure is part of the journey, you're not terrified of it. There are, I, I once saw Jerry Seinfeld on stage bombing, one of the worst comic act I ever saw. And, and at one point he stopped and he looked at the audience and goes, hey, anyone have a question? Uh, hey, anyone have a question? <laughs> I said, remember it. And it was, it was a night where at the improv where like there were 10 stand-up comedians is the audience, the worst audience you could ever imagine. Angry, disgruntled comedians, mad that Jerry Seinfeld, the richest guy they'd ever seen, is up there bombing. And had pushed them not to be in the show because Jerry's here. Everyone had to, you know, no, he can't go on. And once asked, hey, your book, you're selling it for like 20 bucks. How are you going to make any money? He's like, you're the only person in Hollywood worried about me making money. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and and then the immediately the audience laughed. And then he built another joke and they laughed and they laughed and laughed. And then I saw Jerry Seinfeld come back. And I realized the brilliance of him was allowing himself to fail and understanding that was part of, of what you have to do. And I, I've seen a, a lot of people, you know, I mean, uh, when we did broad, Broadway, uh, I remember Henry Jabez uh, auditioned for the show uh, two years ago. This is the journey we went on together is that he didn't really speak English. He was at a Berlitz school learning English. And even that he knew he wanted to go on stage. And he was the first time he did a monologue in English. He had a panic attack. But, you know, from that to going all the way to Broadway, I've just seen it so many times. Like, you know, I directed Tiffany Haddish or people like they're just starting off. I mean, Gabriel Iglesias was in Latino Logs. There's a lot of people that have been in Latino Logs that I've seen their careers blossom. So I understand failure is more of a process. And but the fear of failure is the one thing that holds most people back. So embrace the failure, you know, lean into the failure. In fact, there's an exercise they use, I forget who does it, where they actually ask you to say something you know they're going to say no to. So get used to hearing no. So the question, the man goes back to hamburger, Burger King and says, hey, can I get a, a refill on the meat in my burger? <laughs> they go, Why are you talking? Yeah, I, I, want to, I want just to refill the meat in the burger. You get a free glass. No, no. After weeks of no and all that, after a while, you go, let me try to sell someone on something, a product I think they will want and will work for them. That's easy. So, so is the fear of failure is normally what holds people back. And, you know, for every line you write and for every book you write or speech you give, there is an opportunity for failure, but there's an opportunity for growth. And I always say to people, what's the best outcome that could happen? If you go, well, people are going to think I'm horrible. And I, well, what if they think you're good? What if they, what if, what if your story, and I've seen this in my own life. I'll tell a story and someone will walk up to me literally after a show and say, oh my God, you're, you're like, you're telling my uncle's story. That was amazing. And are you talking, that was me. We recognize ourselves in stories because we want to be a part of the story. So don't be scared of failure. And that's, that's what I learned. And it is an important part of the book because what people are not, what reason they're not writing is they're scared of failure. You know, so Winston Churchill once said, success is going 
from failure to failure without lack of enthusiasm. Success is going from failure to failure without lack of enthusiasm. And what I say is that failure, if you spell the word failure, F-A-I-L-U-R-E, within the word lure, there's the lure of success. We, yeah. As long as we learn from that experience, then that whatever we failed at was not a waste of time, energy, money, anything. It was an amazing experience. What is mm -hmm. life? How do, we, how do we define life? Life is a series of experiences. And it also goes back to that, that, that famous saying, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get back up. Yeah. I mean, yes. Back up yeah, one. Saved, saved by the, the great philosopher Rocky Balboa. Hmm. Um, you know, that's the, the truth is that you, it's, it's, it's getting up, understanding you might be hit again. and <laughs> Most likely will be. And, and that's the kind of thing as a stand-up comic, you know, one thing the exercise we use is we'll tell people to call themselves a writer. And, and you, you, I've done it before in class. We'll say, you know, introduce yourself as a writer. And people get so freaked out by introducing themselves as a writer. And once they say the word, I'm a writer, it becomes less and less of a problem. And, you know, that's part of it is, is, is claiming it, saying it, I'm a writer. You didn't say you're a great writer. You didn't say you're a brilliant writer. You didn't say you're a critically acclaimed writer. You simply said you're a writer. So that's the beginning. You know, it's, if, if it if is self-awareness is, you know, I am. And, you know, and uh, understanding it. Being a writer is, is the height of self-awareness. And one of, one of the great things about, about the world we live in today is, um, is there are fewer barriers to getting read, getting published, getting seen, where in, in previous generations, and I have a lot of, you know, a lot of sympathy for people who, you know, because there's a lot of racism in, in, in the world, in the country, um, that when they're young, they're told, oh, you can't do that, or that's not for us, or, um, you know, you know the, the writer's constant thing of just getting rejection letter after rejection letter, or the filmmakers, you know, oh, we're not going to do your film, we're not going to do your film. Um, and if you're in a situation where the system is actually, you know, stacked against you, then you give up. And I feel I have a lot of sympathy for people in the 70s and 80s who were writers who never got published um, because the system was, was, was corrupt. But now you can publish on your own. You can start a blog. You can, you know, write jokes or, or commentary on Facebook and find your audience. But more importantly, like we we're saying, this is for yourself. You can do it for yourself to get better. Um, and then people do get published because they have had a blog going for, for years. Like, like Dr. Chopra was saying about the, uh, the blog uh, that his friend did about cancer. It turned into a Pulitzer Prize winning book. So there are fewer barriers. So the need to start and say yes to yourself is so important. But the barriers are, are not there like they were 20, 30 years ago. Victor, earlier you said take the first step. And it reminded me of a wonderful quote by Lao Tzu who said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So for writing and speaking, take that first step. Have that courage, the conviction, the confidence, the ability to say yes, to be vulnerable. Uh, many of those chapters are in the book. Yeah, and, and, and your final chapter in the book is called Courage. Um, because, you know, you're, you were saying you know, people are afraid to be vulnerable. They're afraid to put themselves out there. They're afraid to think of themselves as a writer that they think there's all these stereotypes. Like you're saying, if, if, if you launch into it as a career, you might not make any money, but you can do it as part of your life, as part of your creative self. I remember um, when I was younger, I was writing a lot of poetry and I would research the lives of the poets. And T.S. Eliot was one of my favorite poets. And then I, I, I read about his life and he was a banker. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. You write the wasteland and you clock a nine to five job as a banker. And, and he was good at it too. That was the other thing that surprised me. <laughs> he liked that job and he was good at it. But that we can find ways to maintain that creativity in, in our lives, but it does take an act of courage to say, I want to do this and I'm going to do this. Sure. What happened to Rick? Did we lose Rick? It looks no, he's like, still there. Oh, he's still there. Okay. He's contemplating the, the, the response. Um, but what do you say? Is there is there um, a medical 
um, precursor to having courage. I know that most writers would say it's a nice uh, shot of Irish whiskey, but uh, <laughs> how else you can know, we get there? Uh, I, I think um, different people find uh, that the writing comes in different ways to them. They have different writing styles. Some people dictate, some people just jot notes down and then dictate. Some people wake up at four in the morning, five o'clock in the morning and write. Some people stay up late at night. Some people drink a lot of coffee while they're writing. Some people drink a lot of single malt scotch. There's a wonderful book by Robin Sharma. Uh, his initial book was an amazing bestseller. It's called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And now he's written a book called The 5 AM Club. And his contention is that most of the successful people in this world wake up very early, 4, 4.35. They go through routine, get ready. Then they have a period of silence or prayer or meditation. Then they make their goals. They do a little bit of exercise and then they are successful. And JK Rowling was asked to comment on, on that. And she said, total hogwash. This is a lady who, by the way, was rejected a gazillion times by publishers before the Harry Potter books came around and is now richer than the Queen of England. She gave an amazing commencement speech at Harvard University. Absolutely brilliant. It's one if it's worth, if you haven't watched it, just Google JK Rowling commencement speech and watch, watch it. So she's obviously a late riser and she writes later in the day. So whether you write in the train or on, I do a lot of my writing on flights. I travel nationally, internationally, and I don't watch movies. And I meditate and I write and creative juices come flying out. So whatever works for you, it's a different style for everyone. Yeah, and I think also there's the idea that writers sit around and wait for inspiration or they have writer's block and they just, they don't know how to get around it. But I found that, you know, that the more active you are in, in your life, the more research you do, the more you engage in what you're interested in. It's, it's like you're, you're putting all the ingredients to prime the pump to write. Like you don't, you yeah. just say, I want to be a writer and I'll sit here in front of a keyboard. It's less likely to happen than if you go and do something interesting that you learn and, you know, picking up on somebody else's conversation on a bus or a plane yeah. or, you know, researching uh, technology or, 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 or new developments or reading the news will often trigger some connection that you get inspired about. Uh, yeah. What, what ha used to happen to me is I'd, I'd work on different TV shows as a writer and people would get angry because uh, they, they'd be writing and all of a sudden I'd pick up a magazine and I'd read the magazine. I'd do something totally not involved. And they're like, what is he doing? And someone finally, finally had worked with me on the show says so he's writing. And they didn't understand that term. It's like, I'm writing. I need to turn my mind off this problem and let the problem it will arrive. And I'll, I'll, I'll have a solution. But there's too much clutter going on. So sometimes I need to quiet my mind. You know, uh, Sanji through meditation, me sometimes through distraction. Either way, the answer will come. If you, put the, if you ask for the answer, what's, you know, a lot of times I'll say, well, how am I going to end this show? Or how am I going to begin this show? Whatever it is. I'll, I'll put that question in my mind and then I'll fall asleep. Next morning, I normally have an answer. I mean, almost always. So it's, sometimes it is the quieting of yourself in a different way. The meditation, the, the answer will come. It's not, it's the writer's block is really more fear of, of not having an answer. And that fear, and that f it's hard to do anything with fear. Fear is, a, is, you know, yes, it can motivate you in certain areas, but I would say most of the times when things are going well, you're, you're in a zone that is not frightened at all. You're in a creative zone. You're in a zone where you're listening, you're enjoying life, you're seeing things happen, uh, you're involved, and an answer will come. It's just it's a lot of times people think it's them. Like though, I'll see writers that have to look miserable writing. Because they feel, oh, I, I can't earn this unless I'm miserable. There was a, a, a famous writer who said, uh, it's easy to write. Just go to typewriter, open your veins and bleed. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I know Sanjeev doesn't either. 
I think a lot of times writing should be a joyous experience and in joyous creativity. I also think it's very appropriate to reach out to friends, colleagues, family, mentors, and say, I'm struggling through this. I'm trying to write this, or I'm trying to speak about this, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting it. And people will help you. They're, they are so creative. There's so much wisdom out there. There's wisdom in children. I call them the modern day philosophers. Mm -hmm. you know, John Lennon, when he was six years of age, goes to school and the teacher gives the kids an assignment. Write down what you want to be when you grow up. He writes happy and he hands it to the teacher. And the teacher says to him, John, you didn't understand the assignment. And he looks up and he says, and you don't understand life. Six-year-old. His mother, every night when she tucked him into bed, said, John, when you grow up, I want you to be happy. Infinite wisdom. Five-year-old girl was asked by her mother, uh, complete the sentence, uh, happiness. She says, mommy, happiness is when the heart feels bigger. Five-year-old. A three-year-old, son of a surgeon. I gave this talk on happiness and living with purpose at Harvard Med School. And he was a program director, wanted to meet with me. So we had coffee. We sat down. He said, Sanjay, my son is going to be three years and two months from now. He's two years and 10 months. I asked him, what makes you happy? He says, Daddy, I'm most happy when I'm sharing my toys with my friends. Albert Schweitzer said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. So there's so many things we can do. Reach out, you know. I think it was Harry, uh, Jack Welch who said, it is a badge of honor to get good ideas from someone else. Badge of honor to get good ideas from someone else. So reach out. If you're struggling with writing or speaking, reach out, read books, start doodling, just get started. Yeah, and also as a writer or a performer or as a speaker, uh, you can't really improve unless you get feedback from other people. You need to see people respond, you know, if they laugh or cry or, 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 or if you're a horror writer, if they're afraid, you can see that and you know your, your craft is working. But, uh, you know, there's also a stereotype of having to write in the, in the garret, in the, in the basements and get all your stuff and, and not share it. That's, that's not really a healthy approach to writing either. Um, but I wanted to share, I don't know if you can see it here, but this is the book right here. Ignite the Fire Within. You can get it on Amazon. It's a bestseller on Amazon. And you can also get it on Kindle. So I know that if you subscribe to Amazon's Kindle Unlimited, Unlimited it's, a free, it's a free selection. Um, and that's like $10 a month or something like that. Or you get a free 30-day trial. So you can read this book in 30 days. You'll become a better writer and speaker for free. But uh, spread the word to buy the book. Um, and uh, so I want to open up the questions. But that was a beautiful... Um, uh, you know, uh, observations and, 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 and statements there, uh, Sanjeev. Rick, did you have anything you want to say before we open it up to questions? No, I, I, I really look at it and I say it is an action. Writing is an action. So, uh, so act. I mean, it, go forward. Write. You didn't say you're a great writer. You didn't say you're a clerical acclaimed writer. You said you were a writer. And that is just someone who tells stories and who communicates. And, and is also a, a chronicler, uh, someone that looks at their life and writes it down because this life is passing for all of us. There has to be a record somewhere. And writing it down, is if it only reaches you, is enough. But I think stories are universal, though, though you have no idea how where they can go. And I, in my class alone, I do online classes of writing. Um, two of my students have already pu published books. Um, one's already written a screenplay. I mean, it's amazing to see the growth in people. So I, I encourage you all. So and, let's and, answer questions. And to go back to the beginning, I think what we said, it's about saying yes to you. You're writing for yourself. You're writing mm -hmm. to improve your, your, your craft, but also to tell your story, to um, get your frame of reference, your experience out there, especially like, like I've mentioned before, in, in a culture and industry that has not been open to multiple frames of references, to multicultural voices. Um, we no longer have those barriers that were placed on us for a hundred years or more, you know, we are in, in a driver's seat and can get to the audiences that share 
you know, that share our vision, that share our experience and who want to learn about it. But um, you're going to get better. You're going to, um, you know, reach people who, who need to hear your message and, um, and you're going to be a writer. And so, so, so do we have any questions right now? Um, I see some nice people in the audience who, who uh, are good artists and also uh, have participated in our events before. I'll start it off if you don't mind. Go for it. This is Ruben Alvarez. Uh, hi, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, you're, you're very inspiring um, to me at this point because I'm at, uh, uh, at a crossroads as well. I've been writing like crazy. Rick and uh, Butch, I know this. I got about 25 different um, uh, notebooks just full of ideas, not to mention all my, my hard drives. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sl slowly synthesizing it. But something, uh, and you know, to make it a product, right? Because the other end of this is how to make it into a a, a marketable product that I can take to an agent per se. What what are your uh, advice uh, to 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 carry on my particular uh, journey? Because uh, like like I said, I have a lot to say. I've said it. I've written it down. Now um, I, I need to finish it up like what you said, the completion. What is the completion, not only of the stories, but of this journey? So the question is, um, what do you suggest for me to do at this point? Is, is, is the, the idea of completion, the punchline of a story, is, a, is that tantamount to getting something marketed? I think it's a great question. I think um, depending on what the theme is, you should reach out to like-minded people and have them review your manuscript. Don't worry about plagiarism or stealing. I give gazillion talks a year. I see people taking notes and I say, you know what? Don't take notes. You can have access to every single slide I'm showing. You can modify it. You can change it. You don't even have to give it give me attribution. I call it copy left. <laughs> That's a good one. So share your ideas with people you trust, good friends. They will help you. You must uh, embed a lot of stories. Quotes are very, very powerful. An inspiring quote at the end of the book, at the start of every chapter, we have a quote. Every book I've written, I've done that. And, and don't be afraid of failure. You know, the first book I wrote, <clears throat> Disorders of the Liver, I was a junior faculty member at Harvard Medical School and I burnt the midnight oil. You know, there was no Wikipedia, Google. I had to go to the Countway Medical Library, the biggest medical library in the world, look up the original articles and Xerox or take notes. And then, so over two months, I wrote Table of Contexts, forward and three chapters send it to five publishers and four of them said not interested we already have a major textbook in gastroenterology hepatology and the fifth one from new york said i want to come and take you out for lunch so he comes to boston we go to legal seafood great restaurant as soon as we sit down he said we're not interested in your book i said jim you came from new york to take me out for lunch to tell me that he said, yes, <clears throat> but you have an amazing writing style. Every sentence is weighted with information and knowledge. Would you consider editing a GI pathophysiology book for second year medical students? And I looked at him and I said, yes. And I said to myself, in every adversity is the seed of greatest success. I'm now gonna have two books. So I invited one of my colleagues Roger May from Mass General Hospital to edit the book with me. And that became a major textbook for many, many years. And my first book, Disorders of the Liver, was published and translated into Italian, Japanese, Portuguese, Czech, and so on. So be prepared for failure. Failure is sometimes a gift. If you go with that attitude, you will have unmitigated success. Yes, thank you. Oh, 
what, one more little thing. Um, and like you said, mentors or people to read your stuff, they're, they're far and few between. And, and I found a few people. But when I need inspiration, to tell you the truth, a writer, or a Writer's Digest wrote a book or, or compiled a book called Guide to Good Writing. And it put everybody, it was a like hundred years worth of quotes and uh, little antidotes about writers. And every single writer for the 20th century has something in here. And that's when I learned that um, I don't have to have a particular schedule to write or that if I have a couple beers in me when I'm writing or, or some other substance, it's okay. I uh, just flow with your creative juices. So uh, if anybody uh, needs uh, or doesn't can't find those additional people to, to, to inspire you, I recommend the book. You can get it for maybe four or five bucks on uh, eBay. But uh, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also, um, no, experience is the best teacher. So I like to say um, you can learn from your own mistakes, but you can also learn from other people's mistakes. And when you get references like that, you know, or when you talk to people, you know, they'll tell you what works, but they'll also tell you what didn't work for them. So you can avoid pitfalls and, and writer's guides like that. I know I had one on directors and a lot of the great stories were about the failures that they had had and how they had led to a new perspective or a new approach. And to um, to follow up on what Dr. Chopra said about being, you know, being uh, ready to fail, you also have to be ready for success because that's something that scares a lot of people too, yeah. is once they do get the opportunity you know, they, they, they freeze up. And this is true in public speaking when you're on the stage and you have to, uh, you have to speak. Um, but um, uh, Rick, did you have a thought? Did we lose Rick? Oh, we might've lost him. He's on his, uh, he's on his phone. Um, but I, uh, I think I have a question. Yes, Kaleem. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you so much to share your experience and uh, writing. Uh, I'm not a writer, I'm an artist. But I've been writing my biography about my experience in the art, art environment and in, in communities, artist communities. But my question is uh, how can I comply and to pull together my history about my biography from the beginning? Because I write sometimes. Uh, whatever I come to my mind, I, I write uh, my experience and my whatever happened in that moment. And so I don't know if I can put things together for, to continuously the history or 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 or, or, or uh, for uh, for dates or for to continue the history. I don't know. I you know because I have no experience with that. So yeah, I, you know it doesn't have to be chronological. If you're writing your own biography, autobiography, it doesn't have to be, you know, I was born in such and such year and such and such date and such and such place. It could start with something that happened to you at age 12. But as long as it's a very powerful and gripping thing, uh, that happened to me at age 12. And I put it in the book that I wrote with my brother, Deepak Chopra, called Brotherhood, Dharma, Destiny, and the American Dream. He wrote 12 chapters, I wrote 12 chapters. We did a five day tour and then it was national bestseller. And one of the chapters I, I wrote was called Blind for a Day. And the story is I was 12 years of age, studying at St. Columbus High School, New Delhi, arguably the single best all boys school in India. And on a sultry warm weekend, I play a cricket match and on Sunday evening, I'm not feeling well. Uh, it's very hot, humid. I'm reading Reader's Digest and I close my eyes. I take a nap. I wake up and I'm terrified. I look and I can't see. I blink my eyes. I'm blind. I nudge my brother. I said, Deepak, I can't see. And he must have done visual threat and reckoned I wasn't faking it. And he started to cry. I have one brother and he's turned blind. So my uncle, we were staying with my uncle and aunt to go to this school. My parents were 200 miles away. They wanted us to finish our schooling at St. Columbus High School. My uncle takes me to the military hospital where the doctors examine me and they don't have the foggiest ideas as to what's going on. I can hear them talking. They're even saying hysterical blindness. Hello, if you are faking it and you come from the side with a sharp object, you will blink. Anyway, they finally get a hold of, I was a good student, a good athlete, happy kid. Finally, they get a hold of my father, 1961, in an army jeep. Very calmly, he says, tell me everything that's happened to Sanjeev 
in the last two months. He said, he's been fine. He said, no, everything, any injuries, any meds. He said, oh yeah, he had a laceration to his right leg with a sharp object six days ago, taken to the casualty ward, got sutures. Did he get an antibiotic? They look, antibiotic. Did he get a tetanus shot? Very proudly they said, yes, he got a tetanus shot. My father asked one more question. What kind of tetanus shot? Anti-tetanus serum, ATS, or anti-tetanus toxoid, ATT? So they looked in the records and they said, anti-tetanus serum. Now my dad was brilliant. He was a cardiologist, but he knew everything in medicine. I don't know how he divined it, but he said to them, Sanjeev is having a rare idiosyncratic reaction to the anti-tetanus serum. It occurs one in half a million people. He has a localized form of serum sickness only affecting his eyes. He has bilateral optic neuritis. The optic nerve is going to burst, it's swollen, start an intravenous and give him massive doses of corticosteroids. 1961, it was done. 12 hours later, my vision returned. And the next day I said to myself, you know, my dharma, my moral compass, authenticity, vocation, truth is to be a doctor and a healer like my father. So if you tell that story early on, I give a keynote, dharma, happiness and living with purpose. And initially I used to define dharma, then tell the story. Now I start with the story because it's very powerful. It's very gripping and people then pay attention. So in your biography, autobiography, whatever story is powerful, you can start with that and then go back, go back and forth. Some books, people go back and forth. And it, sometimes it's a little tedious, but it, it does work. And I would- Carl, Carl, Carl Reiner said, write what you know. Yeah, write what you know. What was that, Rick? Carl Reiner said, write what you know. And what, what person do you know better than yourself? Yeah. And, and I would add to, uh, to what you all were saying is that I think, and, and as I, you know, you can do now because we live in a, in a multidisciplinary kind of environment, um, you can come into writing from other perspectives. So if you're a painter, find the tools and the techniques that you use as a painter, because now you're just telling a story in a different medium. But I think it's important to get it all out, to put out the raw materials. A story may emerge, a structure may emerge, relationships emerge, but unless you put it all out there, you're going to miss something. So I would say keep writing your stories down, practice, you know, just writing small sections of it, things that inspire you, and then they'll add up over time. And back to what uh, Ruben was saying, it's also important to keep doing what you're doing and getting it out there because it's very possible right now that if you start off um, with the idea for a book, that somebody might think it's a good idea for a streaming series or a film, you know, so you may think you may see it as a book, but as you're telling people, someone may go, well, I'm a filmmaker and I see that as a movie and you got to be ready and, and available to go. Yes. I'm totally into that. Yes. And I'm, you know, um, but to be ready for that success, like we were talking about earlier. Um, okay. Uh, another questions. Rob, you have yeah. Well, uh, just thank you for, for this, uh, very inspiring. And just like what uh, Victor was saying right now is my writing is not for book form. It is for script. So like everything I write is pretty much in script form or an outline form for script, uh, for script. Um, and then the last few and Victor knows this, I've, uh, I have five short films that I wrote from dreams that I had before I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, can you, anybody speak to that? Uh, yeah. Those types, you know, writing, writing from that perspective from dreams. Well, I, I, I can, I can speak to that. I'm, I'm at, I had two brain surgeries and they say I might need a third. I'm not sure, but wow. uh, I was in a coma for two weeks. Wow. Okay. Medically induced. Yeah, me most people don't. Yeah, most people don't even know this about me. I tell you, even though it's in a book, almost what? Whoa, <laughs> but, whoa! Man. And, you, and you had to relearn how to write, right? No, actually, it was funny. I was <laughs> reciting Shakespeare coming out of the out of the coma, and and, and then I my first joke was actually a pretty body joke. Uh, there, a nurse came up to me and I said, "Do you know how to get a man out of a coma? Give him Viagra. That will work." 
<laughs> that was that'll, that'll get them up. That's what I said. That'll get them up. Get them up. And so I, I said that joke, and they're like, "Who the hell is this guy?" And I was just coming out, saying jokes, going back in, and it was very weird. And friends, you know, saw me this way. Um, it's not that I had to relearn. Uh, it was more like it it gave me a a, a way to look at life differently. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll never look at someone in a, in a wheelchair ever without feeling exactly. compassion. You know, as you, you, I, I bought a Tesla, so I wouldn't be, I'd be less on the environment. I did a lot of, you know, uh, self discovery things of, of changing myself. Not that I was a bad person, right? No one's a, you know, but it's just that I wanted to be a better person. That was really it. So speaking of that, I write screenplays, you know, and, and I write, uh, books, of course, but I, I, when it comes to screenplay, action. You know, yeah. you get a little bit of action, then it's some dialogue, and it's almost the opposite in writing a book. You go, you know, it, it is act, all action. It's all description. It's all these thousand things, and a little bits of dialogue. But um, when you come from a place like you're taking dreams, dreams are, are a great way to leave your body. And I think we have that, and and in ancient cultures it's like another realm is spiritual realm and that's where the dreams are so i think you've kind of gone on a vision quest as we say you know i was on an indian reservation for a while and i've learned a lot from the natives and your these dreams you have are part of your visions and what a great thing to 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 now translate them into a form that other people can understand such as re- reading it or actually seeing it in terms of film but you know as a filmmaker most of the time they tell you show it don't don't say it you know can can we see it without ever having a word spoken so you're already working i see very positive things in you that you're working in all these different environments mm-hmm. so just understand you're on the right path and working in these environments i would say be more, do more one of the things i'll tell people is be more of you and people you know because if you're coming from a perspective i want to make it in hollywood right Hollywood needs you. You don't need Hollywood. You know, in other words, tell your story. Be specific to you. That's the story they're looking for. I, I've been at a thousand auditions or I've watched actors audition for me. And the ones that always get the job, hands down, are the ones that are, are most authentic to themselves. I can see it. You know, you can't mistake it. You look at a cat on stage. Well, all of a sudden there's a cat on stage. You go, you're immediately drawn to that energy, that life, that being. It's not, they're not acting like a cat. They are a cat. So I would say, find that part in you that wants these dreams, that wants to translate them. And whether it's on the page or the stage or wherever you want to put it, you know, make it as crystal clear and as as specific to you as possible. Does does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Uh, It's just these uh, five stories that I have are completely like, just and Victor's seen the first film that I did. I screened it at his uh, at their uh, uh, film festival, and it's just like what you were saying. There's only one word in the whole film. It's an eight minute film, and it's all action. I think I got um, the audience to see or to interpret their own uh, feelings about it um, at the very end. So yeah, that that was good. Um, but yeah, no, I I, I thank you. I, uh, that, that, I mean the first. The first film, I think the first film was a was a, about a uh, train robbery. Mm-hmm. And when the when the, the train robber would put the gun and point it toward the audience, women would gasp and scream in the audience. And I thought that's kind of an interesting thing that that it had that power. You think about seeing King Kong, the original, mm-hmm. and imagine seeing King Kong now, how we have actually filled in even more so with stories. Mm-hmm. But we but understand this, people have the capacity to suspend their disbelief, yeah. To, you know, for Ham or not Hamlet, Henry V to say, "Will this wooden O hold the lofty fields of France?" Oh, we're going to France, and they, the audience is immediately there, and and they're even saying to you, "Hey, use your imagination." <laughs> you know, little kids who tell stories. So, I, I think you're in a really great place, and even if it's eight minutes with just one word, uh, that'll get attention. That'll get attention. I, I remember seeing one. It was like Cholo Chaplin or something like that. It was a guy who did uh, Chaplin as a Cholo kind of uh, 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 Chola. thing. Did you ever see that? 
I remember that. Yeah, that was like 10 years ago, right? Yeah, but yeah. I still remember it yeah. because it's so unique. There's a lot of, there's, you don't know who you're going to affect. I remember Quentin Tarantino went and saw one of my shows and hung, hung out backstage and I got to talk to him. He told me he loved a film I did years ago called Red Surf. Bro, me and George Clooney in a film called Red Surf, probably the most exploitive B film you could imagine. <laughs> Just really horrible. He loved it. So you'll be surprised when you do something where someone goes, oh, my God, I love that. Or I love that eight minute dream film. It really got me thinking in this way. Because, yeah, and I've, I've had people come up to me at the end and like, yeah, because yeah, yeah. art is art, art is inspiring. Your art would inspire me or inspire someone else. You may not have written, you know, uh, Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings, but you might have inspired Tolkien one day or someone, an artist like that art is like an energy that keeps going forward and forward. And, and it goes out to as many people as possible and sparks as many ideas. So um, keep doing what you're doing. That's my advice. And I, I actually, I, I believe I've met you a few times uh, here in San Antonio at the Guadalupe or at the Majestic, I believe with uh, Culture Clash. Oh yeah. 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 I, uh, well, Victoria I, I, Garcia's brother. Yeah. Everybody yeah. Knows my, my sister. Yeah. It's, <laughs> oh yeah. No, it's, uh, I just worked with Herbert Sequences from Culture Clash. Uh, yeah down here in San Diego. Um, great guy. And I, I, I wrote the, the uh, I was a writer producer on their, their series and we yeah. wrote some really funny stuff back then. Like we both laugh at about it. Now we're going like, wow, we're way ahead of our time to yeah. write that. Yeah. Cho so, Cholo trapped in a well. Yes. Cholo was trapped me. In a well. I was you, you find it on, if you can find it on, uh, <laughs> on YouTube, I think it's out in like, they, they found the, the footage or they, did yeah, they found the footage. They were they asked me, they're like, Hey, you mind we play this? I'm like, no, go ahead. It was a, um, it was a very inspiring we ran out of money and we, we didn't have money for a set so i said we're gonna write cholo trapped in a well because all those babies trapped in a well stories and uh it was one of the funniest sketches there and with done with zero money zero money and people remember it to this day yeah yeah um but i think the important thing in terms of the conversation we're having today is is to get develop your voice tell your story at whatever um uh, level you're at right now to to uh, build and on on your experience and and buying the book is a perfect way to do that right there on Amazon and ignite the fire within um, and so just like I said wherever you're at you're going to get better if you just keep doing it but the important thing is to tell your story you can choose a path where you can become very technically proficient and and a commercial writer and and write genre that like you know, you can write a hundred scripts for TV and they're all the same that have none of nothing of you in it and make a living. But wherever you're at right now, I think it's important to tell your story with the tools that you have and you can reach a world audience and find somebody who wants to read it that shares that builds community and also to um, to share it with people. Um, because a lot of times with Hollywood, I mean, uh, films get written and paid for that are never made scripts you get produced that are never shown. So, you know, you could go that path or you could write your own story and get it out there and have people start to see it now. Any more questions? We have. Yeah, I got one for Rick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rick, you missed my, my, my question a little bit earlier, I'm pretty sure, uh, because I want to know about the, um, when you write a story, let's say we're, we're all great storytellers, right? But um, I was told yesterday by, by another person that, that we all know and that's a screen or not a screenwriter but a uh, playwright she said because uh, i pitched her a story and she goes okay why does a story need to be told now do you measure that to the marketability of the story or what the real story is because obviously one the marketability how are you going to sell it and make it a book or sell it to hollywood pitch it or it's going to come to a completion for yourself and never gets published I think the first ones, I mean, look, I, I probably know that. I, I think I know the playwright. <laughs> um, uh, you know, first of all, I never tell anyone. I will never tell anyone, don't do it. That's the worst advice you give anyone. Or, or why, why is it important or whatever. I don't think that's the quite the right answer. Because if you go on why, then you're going to be looking going, well, just Hollywood, is Hollywood going to buy the story? Well, Hollywood doesn't know what stories they're going to buy. They never do. They, they, every single Hollywood success was considered, was most likely going to be a disaster. Star Wars. I know the woman who did coverage on Star Wars for Fox and said, this is the worst script I've ever read. Truthfully, 
And there were a lot of people who wouldn't do the movie because they thought it was the worst movie ever was Star Wars. Uh, Desi Arnaz had to go perform in 12 uh, live uh, productions of, of I Love Lucy, get his own cinematographer and then do it. And the, the networks weren't sure it was going to go. Uh, Mo- Seinfeld, you can just go on and on and on. It's, it is always hard to be the leader, to be the top, to be the pioneer. But someone eventually has to leave the safety of the cave and go forward. And that may be you. So it, if you sit there and say Hollywood's uh, viability of what they want, no one, and I repeat this, no one knows what Hollywood wants, including Hollywood. They normally, Hollywood wants to be second, never first. So if all of a sudden murder mysteries are the thing, let's get murder mysteries until that isn't the thing. And all of a sudden, I, I remember I was pitching a political story years ago. Um, like when I first started my career, it was about, it was about Washington and his lighthouse. And I was told, oh, we don't want political stories. Those won't work. And then I'm like, uh, West Wing. Yeah. So it's, that's the worst reason to say what Hollywood wants. Cause, cause no one really knows. I would say be unique, tell your story. If this is your, your idea that you want to do and write it as a screenplay or, or doing itself. What's the worst thing that can happen? You'll be a better writer afterwards. Writing is is repetition. If you write a lot and get used to writing and start to see it, you develop a second hand for writing. I, I wrote a screenplay just now in three weeks, you know, with a partner. And uh, I think it's pretty darn good. And people are saying it's really good. Um, if someone told me you could write a screenplay in three weeks, I'd be, oh, it's impossible. It's, you know, impossible. Nothing's impossible. You know, you can do this. So I would, I would be the opposite. I would encourage you to say, well, it's not why. It's I, is it why not? Why not yeah. write it? Yeah. What's, what's, what's but, the downside? No, it's, it's not a matter of writing. It's, it's like, okay, what's the punchline? What, what is the grab? What, what is, uh, if you're going to tell a story, right? Aesop Fables, for example, right? And we've had those yeah. as, as time has, has been around. So, um, she say that that there has to be a why, right? There has to be a completion. And I'm going like, okay, um, if I go that route, and, and thank you for the inspiration because I'm going to go my route because uh, I'm not going to go for that typical Hollywood ending that we all want. It's going to be a realistic ending of a real life, as you will. Yeah. If, if you wrote about the San Patricios, you know what the ending is? They all get hung. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's pretty sad. <laughs> You know, if you want to write, write about, you know, Schindler's List, what's the ending? Seven million Jews die. Very bad. You know, you know? It, it's not, you know, that's what's so funny about Quentin Tarantino when he did a Hollywood tale about the Manson murders. He gave the actual Hollywood ending. You yeah. know, that they didn't get killed, all that stuff. It was really brilliant. Yeah. So I think writing itself is, is, a, is a, a med- its own meditation. Its own uh, world. It's something you can do all day long. It's something you can do, whether professionally or non-professionally, or just fairly, uh, mostly for yourself. It's it's that important because you, when you write, you're expressing yourself. When you're right, you're saying, "I exist. I'm important. I, you need to hear this story." You know, that's the thing. Most artists are crippled by insecurity, and that's very normal. I, Sanji will tell you, he told me a story. It was a George Harrison, Sanji, about when he asked you what you learned. Yeah, we, we were invited to my brother's home for dinner when he lived um, in Boston. And he said, you're going to meet some interesting people. So we go and it's George Harrison and Ravi Shankar. And what an amazing evening. And George Harrison had a new album coming out. And he played it. And I happened to be sitting next to him and he says, do you like it? Do you like it? I said, George, it's great. He said, I think the second half is better. So no matter who we are, Nobel laureates, celebrities, rock artists, scientists, (coughs) writers, speakers, we're all looking for validation. It's just part of the human spirit. And so one of the things we can do is to encourage people to pack other people's parachute, to catch people doing things right, to pay them a compliment. It's a simple act of kindness. The Dalai Lama once said, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. Yeah, that, that's, that's well said and brilliant. I mean, what, 
this playwright, this, her first name started with a J, <laughs> but I would say this about this playwright. I, I, I have nothing bad to say about her. She's a, she's a, a wonderful woman. But I think the question was wrong. Yeah. So why? That's not the real reason. It's, it really is why not? Why not write this? What's the worst thing going to happen to you? Uh, and, and that's the thing. When you hold these stories inside, they're, they're unrealized. They're untold. The greatest you know, moment, I always say, because what's it like being a writer? How do you like it? And I go, I love being have, having written. <laughs> In other words, I don't like necessarily writing. I like having written it. And then I get to look back and go, wow, it's really good. I, where'd that come from? That was great. So write it out. So that way you don't have to say, you know, you didn't write it. You didn't do it. Uh, you know, when I was a young actor in San Diego, people used to say, oh, someday I'm going to go to L.A. Someday I'm going to go to L.A., go to Hollywood. And I'm like, it's 110 miles from here. Is it really that difficult to go to Hollywood? No. <laughs> Most of us put in our, our, our own minds these 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 uh, we're like a tiger that's had a little string on their neck since they were a kitten. We can't. Oh, we can't break the skin string. We can't be free. No, no. It's it's all us. The fault lies in ourselves, not in our stars. Horatio. I think that's what the quote is. It's in ourselves. So write that story. Now, I think you have to write the story just, oh, to, just to go screw you. I wrote the story. Oh, well, you never know what's going to happen. Basically, to give you the, the quick uh, premise, it's it's a uh, it's called Bus Stories. Life's, life happens between the stops, and it's over 30 years. Every 10 years, you see the same three women get on the bus from Santa Ana to Newport Beach as their house workers, and each one of them uh, has a son. They just came from Mexico, and they're 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 plotting the, their son's lives. You know, of being successful in the United States, and in each one of the scenes, you see the mother. Uh, you know, saying this is what I want for my son, and then he, the, one of the particular, that particular son gets into uh, gangs and drugs, right? And then the next one um, wants to be a performer and an artist and all that, and then he ends up getting AIDS. And then the other one says, "Well, you know, I just want my son to be helpful and and contribute back to the community and becomes a, a teacher, then a a principal, and then a superintendent." So she was trying to say, "Well, what's why why are you writing this? What what's the point?" Because every there's three scenes, each scene you see the woman getting, um, you know, the women getting older and older, right? To the point where, you know, you get to the punchline 30 years later. So that that's the basic. And the reason I was a, as I say, I need more woman dialogue, right? Because I don't know what a woman would particularly think in these situations. And, and even more to the point, the names of the women are, are ironic. They're Inocencia, Gratudes. And milagros, right? So yeah, it's miracle and innocent. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I listen. I mean, I'll be a Hollywood executive. Could it be in outer space? Sure, uh, <laughs> that would be a Hollywood executive. It's I totally would say write your story. I mean, to me, it sounds like a good novel. It sounds like a a, a good novel more than a film because you have asking people to to really age these characters and follow the story. But I think it's fine. I don't yeah. know why anyone not encourage you to write that. Yeah, it sounds like a, I mean, it's, it's a great premise. I would say that my advice would be stop asking that that playwright for yeah. advice. Stop, stop, because stop because asking, the only the only reason for permission the only reason that matters yeah exactly the only reason that matters into why you're writing the story is because you want to write the story. There doesn't need to be any other justification. Does it have a market? Will the market be here five years from now? It doesn't matter to you as a writer. You've got to get it out now because you have your artistic you know feelers out your tendrils that might be five years of everybody else i love to tell this story but we love san antonio i'm from san diego also and um and santa Ana is great there's something really wonderful about living in creative communities that are not like a hundred percent industry towns like los angeles because they're all geared towards trying to write for the industry and they're all second guessing themselves as to what is going to sell but if you live in a community where you just have the freedom to create Naturally, you can get a lot more done, a lot, you know, yeah. develop Robert your own. And, there, yeah, and there's Robert Rodriguez, yeah, uh, San Antonio. Um, but there's, a, I want to tell the story that I remember seeing a, a, a film on Amazon that uh, it was like, I mean, not to put down the film, but it was like the most indie, rasquache, Chicano film that I, you know, that, that I'd ever seen. 
but I loved it. And I was like, this is on Amazon. Like somebody in aggregator bought it. And the film was made in 2006 and it's called Tortillas Again. And it actually stars a friend of mine that I didn't know he was in this film. But if that director hadn't made that film in 2006, where there was zero chance of it getting seen, it wouldn't have gotten to an Amazon Prime where I could have seen it in 2022. So, and it's a, it's a cute film. I really like it. Guy wins a lottery, you know, something, but it's, uh, but it's, it's homegrown. And if this is, was LA, that film would probably never have gotten made in 2006. But this guy probably has made other films and maybe he's got another commercial work doing commercials or, or, or industrial films or as a writer, as an editor. But, but he had that desire to make that film. And if somebody said, why are you making the film? It's not going to sell. He might not have made it and I might not have seen it. So, so that, that say yes to you, I'll go through some of the chapters, your story, failure and adversity, um, the art of listening, vulnerability, less is always best, the story arc and courage. Um, and we've got some nice, uh, uh, praise from uh, Deepak Chopra, from Edward James Olmos, some other folks. Um, like I said, it's available on um, Amazon to buy or if you if on, on Kindle, and you can get a 30-day free trial of Kindle so you can watch the film for free. And so That's uh, the Homeboy discount. Homeboy discount, free. yes. The, uh, or read the book, should say. The film comes later. You guys are going to be in the film next. Yeah. Uh, sorry, George Clooney uh, again. Yeah, that'd <laughs> be great. That it, and it'll be ignite the fire within space, space and outer space, <laughs> outer space. Well, that's that's how they sold. You know, all, all those Hollywood. I've worked in Hollywood most of my life, and and I I think I've done you know had a, I've had a career, and I have to tell you, I, I, everything becomes new again. You know, yeah. <laughs> like when they go. I remember one time Hollywood was this, um, was homeboys in space. And the other one was a dinosaur series where there was these, di you know, and at one point there were more dinosaurs and extraterrestrials on TV and leading roles than there were Latinos. Yeah. That's an actual fact. So I would say stop listening to Hollywood. Yeah. Listen to yourself. Because because I, I can, you know, the films I've gotten made, like nothing like the holidays or movies like that, um, that was based on the life of my father. It was a play. You know, most people don't know that I got my job in living color by uh, being in Latin's Anonymous. They, they saw the sketches and they saw, saw that. Um, and I, did, I wrote that out of fun. I just thought it'd be silly to do Latin's Anonymous. So you have no idea how just pursuing a good time can create art. You right. know, I look at I look at guys like uh, the guys from South Park. They look like they're having fun. They really do. They look, and that's what this should be. It should be a fun exercise. And even if you go, I'm, I'm writing this book, it may start off with your premise. Remember, premises can change. As you're writing it, you're thinking, you know something, I like this character the most, and I just want to follow her. And it's about her. You don't know. If you write, you get it out. Then when you rewrite, you edit, you change, and you do those to answer those questions. But the first thing is your do not let people step on your impulse and your art. That's what you have to follow first. That's beautiful. Yeah, no, just go out and, and do it and don't second guess. Don't don't uh, over edit yourself. Don't be your own censor. Just get it out there. And the one thing I guess that you know as a writer is that you know you can write a thousand pages and you choose whether anybody sees it or not. So you don't really have to be afraid of response or criticism while you're writing it because nobody's going to see it. You can prepare it as much as you want before you put it out there in the public. Um, and for a public speaker, it's different because you know that there is a, um, there's an end result of people seeing it and, and being able to, to respond to you, but you can also rehearse and practice and practice in front of people that you trust um, before you go out there on the stage. Like, you know, you, you want to prepare, um, like an actor prepares, a writer, a speaker prepares as well. And maybe that's something to mention because I don't think people realize that. They think, oh, I'm just going to go out and write a presentation, go out and do it. It's a lot stronger if you rehearse it because then you can change it and hear yourself and record it and watch yourself. Um, and writing's the same way. If you have readings at open mics or in small groups, you get feedback that you can modify it before you present it out into the public. Um, yeah, I, I, I teach classes online. You know, um, I know me and Sanji want to do, develop a course we're going to put online. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can learn now on the, on the web. 
you know, with the power in our own phones is as strong as the computer power to get a man on the moon mm. in our hands. You know, you know, before writing was difficult, you had to have a, this, this press written, uh, made by a guy, and I think his name was Gutenberg, and you had to put, put little things down. It, it's, you know, look how it's all changed. I mean, right now, it's, it's, you can get your story out. It goes viral. Seven million people. I, I remember saw a sketch of mine one time because uh, the, the metrics were there, and you could see it. Seven million people. I was blown away. And that's nothing because there's many times you've done stuff that's millions. So you, you have an opportunity to reach so, so many people in so many ways. Now is the, the generation of communication. And it's also the one thing we need the most to be able to communicate. We're heading toward a civil war of non-communication of people on different sides. So it, your story is necessary. Just remember that. And Sanjeev, did you have anything to, to, to add before we conclude? No, I, I want to express my gratitude to you, Victor, for inviting us on this wonderful show and uh, to say thank you to my friend and colleague, Rick, and to the people who chimed in and asked amazing questions. Thank you for your encouragement and your support. Be happy. Drink coffee. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Wonderful. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude then by saying thank you to you both and thank you to everyone for, um, for participating and those who are watching on uh, Facebook. Uh, it's uh, been a wonderful conversation, very instructive. Buy the book. Um, it's, uh, it's a bestseller and you'll, in, you'll enjoy it. Lots of practical uh, and inspirational material. And we are um, Media Art Santa Ana uh, and we are located at masamedia.org. You can see many of our programs. We have upcoming um, in-person events at our new space, TVGBs on 17th and Main in Santa Ana, 1666 North Main, um, which you can see also on um, at, at our website. And we have a screening coming up of the Three Amigos, which will be virtual. We love film, we love comedy. Uh, um, Steve Martin, a uh, Orange County person, also uh, currently, that was the first time that he was on with uh, Martin Short, and now they have the great series, Only Murders in the Building. Again, starting somewhere, saying yes. Like if this was 1986 and John Landis said, I want to do a, a series set in the Mexican Revolution with these three silent movie comedians, a lot of people would have said no, but those three said yes, and it's uh, the rest is history. So, um, but we're really excited to have you all here. Um, uh, Rick, you're ricknahera.com. Is there a website where people can follow you, um, Dr. Chopra? Yeah. Rick, uh, Rick. Mine is Sanjeev Chopra, one word, S A N J I V C H O P R A dot com. A lot of my books and some excerpts of my talks are there. Yes, and I'm ricknahara.com and follow me on TikTok and uh, uh, all the other forms of mass communication. And, and it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to, you know, I, I, got, I have nothing but great admiration for Sanjeev Chopra. And what you're doing, Victor, as well. So then thank you for everyone listening in. Thank you all. And, and they also have multiple books. So do check out their other books, Brotherhood and uh, from, from Dr. Chopra and Rick has Almost White, Confessions of a Latino in Hollywood, which is really yes. good reviews, really funny book about your, your experience. And you cover your, your experience coming uh, from the, the, the surgery and the recovery from your coma. So really, yeah. inspirational. you guys both write really inspirational work. Uh, so follow them, buy their books. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we'll see you at our next uh, virtual event. But for today, uh, give a round of applause for our, our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you all. Have a beautiful day, everybody. Thank you. Great day. Bye.